Morning Church. It's uh, yeah, awesome to be back here and, and to bring the word to you guys this morning. Yeah, so Matthew 4 verse 5 is what we're going to be looking at, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. So I've preached on uh, Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit here uh, before, and so now I'm going to be preaching on Blessed Are Those Who Mourn. And I know that Daniel not long ago went through the Beatitudes, um, so apologies, but you're getting a, a double dose of that. Um, but yeah, hopefully it will be something a little bit different, a little bit fresh for you guys. So yeah, Matthew 5. Let's read from Matthew 5, uh, verse 1 to 12, just for some context. Matthew 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But our verse for this morning, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come to church and open your word and read about the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that uh, you would open up your word to us this morning, that we would understand it, that it would be uh, preached faithfully, and that we would uh, look to your Son, Jesus Christ, in all things. And we pray for this in his name. Amen. I love music, and I love listening to all sorts of different music. Um, I love happy music, I like sad music, I like angry music, I like fun music, um, and sometimes the best music is when you can get like multiple of these emotions going on at the same time, like when the music gives off one emotion and then the lyrics give off another. For example, happy sad can be the best. Music that is happy and sad at the same time. There are songs where like the vibe of the music is very happy and sunny and hopeful and, and then you listen to the lyrics and you realize it's actually a heartbreaking song. Or alternatively, like some songs can have music that sounds super sad, but then when you listen to the lyrics, it's actually like a really hopeful and sweet song. I love it when music does that. I don't really know why, but somehow the contrast of, of two conflicting emotions can make for a really powerful song. Now, this concept is almost exactly what is going on in our text this morning. In our verse this morning, we have two conflicting emotions. We have something going on that is happy, sad. We have this word blessed, which means in simple terms, happy. We could say divinely happy. So we have this true happiness. But then we also have this word mourning. We have sadness. The ones who are happy are those who mourn. The ones who are happy are those who are sad. By all appearances, we have a happy, sad person. But just like a song, this combination of emotions is getting at something much deeper. So let's delve into this further. We're just going to look at our verse this morning under three words. Blessed, mourn, and comforted. So let's start by talking about this word blessed. One of my best mates um, is a surfer. And he loves everything surfing to the point where he'll even sometimes talk like a surfer does. So he'll, 
he'll say things like righteous or wicked and talk like that, and it's pretty embarrassing. Um, but another classic surfer word that you might have heard before is this word radical. It's a classic surfer word, radical. In the last sermon that I did about uh, the, the poor in spirit, I talked about how the Beatitudes are radical. And they're particularly radical because of this word blessed. Now, in order to see why this word is, is so radical, we need to see what came before in the Old Testament. We need to see what happened in the Old Testament to make sense of what is happening here in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, we see God's dealings with his people. And one of the main things we see with God's dealings with his people is what we call the law. We see the law. And this law was given in Exodus 19 and 20 most clearly. This law all begins with the giving of what we call the Ten Commandments. In Exodus, we have God giving his law to Moses at Mount Sinai. And then Moses communicates these laws to God's people. Now let's just sit in this scene for a bit longer. What did this scene in Exodus look like exactly? What did it look like? Exodus tells us that the scene takes place at a mountain called Mount Sinai. And we read that at this mountain there are limits set around it so that the people can't even touch the edge of it or else they will die. And we read that the mountain is covered in smoke with terrifying thunder and, and lightning. So we have this grand and epic scene in Exodus. We also read that the people there, they were afraid and trembling and that they stood far off. They even begged Moses to not let God just, uh, speak directly to them or else they would die. That's what the scene looked like. But what was the message of the scene in Exodus? If we could summarize it, what would it be? Well, it's the law, the Ten Commandments. But if we had to boil that down, what would it be? We actually know the answer to this because Jesus himself tells us. He tells us in Matthew 22, he says that all the law is summarized in love God and love your neighbor. This is the message. Love God and love your neighbor. The law says, love God and love your neighbor and you will live. The law says, do this, love God and love your neighbor. And so the rest of the story of the Old Testament lives under these commands to love God and neighbor. But there's a problem. Read any of the Old Testament and you will see that there is a problem. And the problem is that God's people did not love him and they did not love their neighbors. They broke the law. And so much of the Old Testament wrestles with that problem because if they haven't done the law, there should be punishment. They should be cursed by God. They should hear the words, cursed are you who have broken the law. And that's almost the note that the Old Testament ends on, this note of curse. But here we are, back in Matthew, years later, one day in Galilee. And Matthew tells us there are crowds following this man called Jesus. And this man called Jesus, he goes up this mountain in order that he might speak to them. And he has his disciples around him too. And, and they want to listen, so they come even closer to Jesus. And so seeing the crowds and disciples, Matthew tells us, he opened his mouth. Just how God had opened the mouths of the prophets throughout the Old Testament, like Moses, David, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Jesus now opens his mouth. In fact, now God opens his own mouth. God's own mouth opens. And what comes out? Blessed. The word blessed comes out. Not the word cursed. But blessed. It's radical. 
It's radical that he speaks blessing. According to the, to the law, this should be a curse spoken, but Jesus speaks blessing. And just look at the Beatitudes. It's, it's not blessing to those who have completed the law, but it's blessing to those who are poor in spirit. In other words, it's blessing to those who know that they haven't completed the law. And then our verse, it's blessing to those who mourn. In other words, it's blessing to those who mourn, realizing that they haven't completed the law. Now, we're going to press into that word mourning a bit more soon. But before we go on, I must ask, are you listening this morning? Are you listening this morning, not to me, but to what Christ is saying here? Christ, in the Beatitudes, is telling us who is blessed. He is telling us who is truly happy. He is telling us who is in his kingdom. He is telling us what the character of those in his kingdom is. And are we listening to this? We're so quick to define these things ourselves. We define blessing. We define true happiness. We define God's kingdom. We have an image in our head of what all these things look like. But are we listening to what Jesus is saying? Are we listening to Jesus' definition? And if we listen, we will find that true blessing looks like mourning. If we listen, we will find that those in God's kingdom look like those who mourn. So with that being said, let's move on to this word mourn. Mourning and sadness are feelings that every single human being has felt. They are feelings common to everyone. doesn't matter where you are from or who you are, these feelings are universal. I remember as a kid, we would often talk about crying. Like I remember kids in school bragging about whether they had cried or not recently. Like, when was the last time you cried? I haven't cried in two years or whatever. You might have heard kids talk like that before and to be honest i don't think i'd ever had much to brag about as a kid i was what my brother might say a crybaby to be honest um but yeah these feelings are universal aren't they the point is mourning is something that all humans can understand and mourning is is not something we're proud of no one wants to be the crybaby but this all begs the question what sort of mourning is Jesus talking about? What does mourning mean here? Because there's a problem with reading this word mourning as if it's just like crying or sadness in general. If we read it like that, is Jesus saying that anyone who has just cried is part of his kingdom? Like if someone's eating an ice cream and the top falls off and they burst into tears, does that mean they're part of God's kingdom? Or if you tear up while watching The Notebook or something? Will they be comforted? Obviously, this isn't the sort of mourning that's in view, right? Or could Jesus be talking about mourning like mourning at a funeral? Obviously, deep heartache and, and mourning happens when someone passes away. But is Jesus just saying that everyone who has felt this mourning will be comforted? No, there's, there's something else going on here. And I... I think it's easy to see when we remember the context. We've already talked about everything that led up to the Sermon on the Mount. We've talked about the law. We've talked about how because God's people had broken his law, they should have heard curses, not blessings. And we've talked about how God spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament. But now here in Matthew, God opens his own mouth and speaks. And so now when Christ speaks, he is speaking of things related to, to the law, he is speaking about God. He is speaking about spiritual things. Let me put it another way. Another way to put it is that the Beatitudes aren't just like a TED talk. You might have watched TED talks on YouTube before, which are like basically inspirational talks or like moral lectures. And 
a lot of them are really great, but it's important to see that something completely different is going on here when Jesus teaches. He isn't just an inspirational speaker. He wasn't a, a moral lecturer. Instead, he spoke about spiritual things. He taught about the gospel of the kingdom. That's the context. Matthew 4.23 it says that Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So Jesus taught about his kingdom. And that is exactly how we are to make sense of the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes aren't an inspirational TED talk. They are a spiritual talk. And we see it in verse 2. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so this is how we are to understand this word mourning. Like all of the Beatitudes, this is spiritual mourning. This is mourning in relation to the law. This is mourning in relation to sin. Let me just expand on the spiritual mourning even further. I'm going to point out three ways. Now, they're all sort of interconnected, but just for the sake of simplicity, I'll point out three sorts of spiritual mourning. Firstly, first first spiritual mourning is what we could call mourning over lack. God's people are marked by mourning over their lack of righteousness. Quite a few months ago, um, in my flat, I live with a, a bunch of guys, uh, one night they did like an Uber order of, of Sundays from McDonald's. I don't know if you're familiar with Uber Eats. Um, but yeah, that's pr it's pretty commonplace in the flat. And my mates, they ordered all these Sundays. Um, somehow I missed out on the memo that they were ordering Sundays to the flat and I didn't get one. And so this order arrived and they were handing out Sundays and I was the only one who didn't have one. Needless to say, I was, I was pretty sad about that, as I'm sure anyone would be. And I was sad, right, because I lacked. I lacked a Sunday. Now, it's kind of a silly analogy, but everybody in God's kingdom has had this sort of experience, but to a far greater me measure, obviously. Those in God's kingdom have had the experience of, of hearing the law, that they are to love God and, and love neighbor, and have realized that they lack just that. They don't have that. They realize that they've broken his law and are completely empty. They've looked within and, and seen no love for God and no love for their neighbors. They've looked within and, and seen that they are poor in spirit. They have seen that they, they don't have righteousness, the righteousness that God requires. And so they mourn. Upon this realization, they mourn. They mourn because... They have no righteousness of their own to offer God. They mourn because they realize that all they should receive from God is, is curses. This empty mourning, this mourning of lack is, is first of all in the kingdom of God. If we are to understand the law rightly, if we understand Exodus rightly, this is the mourning of that we are led to. Secondly, second sort of spiritual mourning, and again, it's, it's still connected, but we could call it this mourning of indwelling sin. God's people are marked by mourning because of their wrestle with indwelling sin. The Bible is plain about the fact that every believer is going to continue to struggle with sin, even though they're saved. And if you're a believer here this morning, you probably don't need me to spell it out for you. We, we all know what it's like. We all struggle and wrestle with sin, and it hurts, and it's difficult, and it's confusing, and it can be frustrating. And so we mourn. We, f we feel sadness because we love our Father and we want to please Him. Any believer in God's kingdom is marked by this sort of mourning. 
And we, we see it in Romans 7 with Paul. Romans 7, verses 18 to 19, let me read that. This is Paul speaking. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And then this line of, of mourning in verse 24, Paul says this. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is mourning right here. This is struggle. This is sadness. Paul and all of us, we want to be delivered fully from sin. We want to be free from its effects. Believer, let this be a word of comfort to you this morning. Your struggle and confusion and mourning over sin within you is characteristic of the kingdom of God. If you feel the weight of your sin and hate it because it displeases your father, it shows that the spirit is within you, making you sensitive to sin and changing you. You are not alone in your struggle. Blessed are those who mourn. Third type of spiritual mourning. Again, still connected. But we could call this third type a, a mourning over the sin of the world. God's people are marked by mourning because of the sin that they see around them. I'm sure we've all had the experience, the experience of watching the news before. Uh, for me, growing up, I'd watch it whenever I went to my nana and Papa's house for the holidays, good times. We'd have dinner on our laps and one news would be on the TV. And I still watch the news every now and then. Um, but when I do, and you might be similar, I can't help but feel this like weight of sadness. We've all seen it. There's, there's heartache and, and sin across our screens every night. And it gets worse because we don't even have to just watch the news to see these things either. There's heartache and sin in, in our families. And there's heartache and sin with, within our friend groups. And there's heartache and sin in our workplaces. And there's heartache and sin on the streets that we live on. And those in God's kingdom mourn when they see these things. We mourn because we know the depth of what sin is. Sin is going against the creator of all things. Sin is going against our father. And we mourn because we know things shouldn't be this way. We await the day when all things are made new and sin is gone. We want that day to come. As people of God's kingdom, we carry this mourning with us. Psalm 119, verse 136. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. You so you see this mourning all throughout God's word. Believer here this morning, do you know any of the sadness? Do you know what it's like to be empty of righteousness? Do you know what it's like struggling with sin? Do you know what it's like feeling the weight of the world around you? Believer, Jesus Christ knows your mourning. He knows your sadness. He doesn't ignore it. In fact, he, he stepped into it 2,000 years ago. Your Savior came into this world of sin, into this world of temptation and sadness, and he felt the weight of it. In fact, he felt the weight of it more than anyone. He wept. We just read that this morning. He was the man of sorrows, and so he understands 
He understands more than anyone. Let that be a comfort to you. And believer, those in God's kingdom are not those who have it all together. Those in God's kingdom are, are those who mourn. God's, God's kingdom is made up of those who are sad, weak, poor, empty, and tired in spirit. Is that you this morning? Then you are Christ's, and Christ is yours. Let's move on to our final word. This word comfort. Comfort. You you may or may not have seen this like recent craze. It's probably a little bit old now to be honest, but this this craze where people have been wearing these things called hoodies. Um they yeah. Hoodies are basically like these massive fluffy blankets with a hood that you can wear around you may have seen ads on Facebook for them or you may have seen people wearing them in the supermarket potentially and they usually have like some pop culture type pattern on them or, or whatever. The kids probably know what I'm talking about, hopefully. Um, now, great, cool. Now, people who have been wearing these things um, for basically one reason, right? And that is comfort. And to be fair, they do look like the peak of comfort, a big, huge, baggy dressing gown. Um, but even if you haven't seen these, right, I'm sure you're still familiar with the, the fact that humans want comfort. You're probably familiar with like your favorite comfortable pair of pants that you wear at home and, and slippers and your ideal comfort food meal or your go-to comfort movie that you've seen a thousand times. The point is that people want comfort. The reality is, though, this is not the comfort humans actually need. The comfort of Udi's is only temporary. Humans need eternal comfort. We need comfort for the soul, comfort that will last. And that is exactly what Christ is offering here. In fact, it is a guarantee for those in God's kingdom. It is a guarantee for those who have mourned over their sin. Comfort. The question is, what does this comfort look like? What does it look like? Firstly, it must be said, there is comfort for those who have mourned in this life. There is comfort for the Christian in this life. There is comfort because while we mourn over our lack of righteousness, we know that we have Christ's righteousness. And we have this comfort even if we don't always feel it. There is comfort because while we mourn over our indwelling sin, the Spirit is still working in us. And we have this comfort even if we, we don't always feel it. There is comfort because while we mourn over the sin that we see around us in the world, we know that God will one day make all things right. We have this comfort, even if we don't always feel it. The reality is that the Christian life is a life of paradox. Or we could say, like we talked about at the beginning, the Christian life is happy, sad. The Christian life is like a happy, sad song. While our lives may be marked by mourning, Deep down, we, we have comfort and the guarantee of comfort. While our faces may say mourning, our souls say comfort. Jesus says the one who is truly happy in this life is the one who mourns in this life. As the Heidelberg Catechism says, it says that we have comfort in both life and death. Because we belong to Jesus Christ. Secondly, though, we are guaranteed comfort in the life to come. We are guaranteed comfort in all of its fullness one day. And what does this look like? Revelation 21 verse 4 tells us. He will wipe away 
every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Christian, this is your guarantee. Your father will wipe away all of your tears, every last one. You will never mourn again. There will be no emptiness to mourn. There will be no sin in you to mourn for. There will be no sin in the world to mourn about. Every injustice will be dealt with. You will have comfort. And it's a guarantee. Here's the logic of the Bible. Here's the logic of the New Testament. If you have mourned in this life, you will receive comfort in the life to come. But if you have laughed in this life, you will mourn and weep in the life to come. Let me break it down further. If you have mourned over your sin in this life, you will receive comfort in the next. But if you have laughed and seen no sin in yourself to mourn about, you will only know mourning and weeping in the next. It's exactly what Jesus teaches us in Luke 6. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Unbeliever here today, if you have not seen your sin as something to mourn over you, God will not comfort you. How can he dry your tears if you haven't cried? How can he comfort you if you refuse to acknowledge your need? How can he comfort you if you are already comfortable in your own pride and sin. Come to him today. Feel your need and he will not reject you. He will not reject you if you come to him. Let me just close where we started. I said earlier that the word blessed is radical. Now, I said it was radical because the people should have heard the word curse, not blessed. They had broken God's law, so what Christ should have said to them was curse, not blessed. So the question is, why did he say blessed? Why did he? Here's the answer. Jesus Christ can call us blessed because he himself was cursed. The word cursed fell on him, on the cross. And get this, Christ was the one man who perfectly summarized Matthew 5 verse 4. He was the perfect mourner. He was the man of sorrows. He wept. He knew what temptation was like. He knew the weight of sin. He felt the weight of the world. He perfectly categorized, ca- sorry, c- characterized this verse. Yet, he didn't hear the word blessed. All he heard on the, on the cross was cursed. The Father cursed him because he took our place. And so now, Christ says to us, blessed not because of anything we have done but simply because Christ has borne the curse for us and you see this in every one of the Beatitudes believer even though your life may be marked by mourning Christ calls you blessed and your comfort is guaranteed Your mourning 
will not even compare to the rejoicing and laughing that awaits you. Psalm 30 verse 5. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we just feel the weight of your word this morning. Father, we acknowledge that those in your kingdom are are those who mourn. Those in your kingdom are those who are empty of righteousness, who have seen your law and realized that we cannot fulfill it. And those in your kingdom are those who still struggle with sin. And we mourn because of it, Father. Those in your kingdom are, are those who mourn because of the sin that we see around us. Father, would you comfort us this morning? Would you show us that it's okay to be Christians who mourn, that those in your kingdom are, are not those who have it all together, but those in your kingdom are those who rely on the work of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, would you make us more like your son? Would you make us more and more like people of your kingdom? We thank you for all these things. We thank you for the work of your son, Jesus Christ, that he accomplished for us, that he was cursed in our place. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.